And I was telling you a little bit before, I'm excited to preach this sermon tonight. I, I'm, this is one of those sermons, for me, it's kind of mind-blowing. It's one of, those, one of those chapters where upon really studying it out and comparing Scripture with Scripture, I just marvel at the depth of God's Word, at the magnificence of God's Word, at the perfection of God's Word. This is the point I was trying to get across on Sunday. On Sunday morning, I preached on the... Um, the prophecies that have been fulfilled in Scripture, and then Sunday night I preached on you know the supposed contradictions in the Bible, but all of that to glorify God's Word and, and showing how man can't do what God has done. And what we're going to see tonight, and this is why I'm so excited about this, is we're going to be looking at um, Psalms. We're going to be looking at Isaiah. We're going to be looking at various passages that are going to... There is no way that man could have, could have compiled... This collection of writings with such perfection, with such accuracy, that is going to be tied in with the, pas- with the passage that we're looking at tonight. We're going to be, so keep that in mind when we start going through these, because I'm going to be making various points. We're going to be looking at, once again, how the reign of King Solomon is a picture or foreshadowing of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. There's going to be many instances where, where these same events that we see here are tied in with future events, just giving us that foreshadowing. We're gonna. I'm gonna try to quickly go through what the chapter is, just the surface meaning. We're gonna get some some gleaning of the passage, but then we're gonna go into. I'm gonna cover at the end just just all the various ways that it ties in with other passages in Scripture, with end times, and I, I'm excited. So let's let's dig into this right now, starting in verse number one. The Bible reads, "And when the queen of Sheba." Heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with hard questions. Now, right off the bat, verse number one, don't read over this. Queen of Sheba, right? She's a, she's a queen in a faraway land, probably from Africa, and she hears about the fame of Solomon, but look at what it says. She heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord. It wasn't that Solomon was lifting himself up and and was promoting himself and that she heard this fame of Solomon and his greatness. Solomon, up to this point, had made sure that the Lord was getting the glory. The Lord was getting the credit. He's the one who built the temple to the Lord. So she's hearing this great fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord. And would to God that we could have such a testimony. That if someone were to, were to hear about you, if one day you were to get some type of fame and people were to hear about you, that it wouldn't be because of something that, that you did and you, you know, like your own works and that you'd be you know, boasting yourself and lifting yourself up for being so great and whatever talents you might have that God gave you, but that people can associate with you the name of the Lord, right? That the fame that you have will be associated and tied completely with the name of the Lord. This is what Solomon had. The Queen of Sheba heard the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord. She came to prove him with hard questions. Verse 2, and she came to Jerusalem with a very great train, which basically a train is a big company. There's a lot of people following her, right? Like So she, came, she rolls into town and there's just... You know, servants and people and goods and the spices and everything else coming with her. She's there, this big pump, this big uh, to do, right? When she comes into town, she came to Jerusalem with a very great train, with camels that bear spices and very much gold and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. So, what we see here, the picture that we're getting of the Queen of Sheba, is she's pretty proud. She's coming in as somebody. Here I come. Look at all of my riches. Look at my spices. Look at this big parade of me coming into town and making this this big event and this big show that I'm finally come here. Right? And, and kind of maybe maybe thinking a, a battle of, of famous people or, a, you know, bringing her wits because it says she came to prove Solomon with hard questions. And what I see pictured here in the Queen of Sheba is a person who is proud and lifted up in their heart that wants to 
prove Solomon by, you know, by maybe bringing him down a little bit. Oh, you think you're so great? Oh, you have, you know, you have your faith in God, right? This is the people who want to deny the Lord and deny God. And they come with all these questions, right? Well, what about this and what about that? This is the Queen of Sheba coming to prove Solomon with hard questions. Look at verse number three. And Solomon told her all her questions. There was not anything hid from the king, which he told her not. She came with all of her questions. He had an answer for every single thing that she brought up. Everything. And his answers were good. Now Solomon's interaction with the queen demonstrates the importance of having wisdom and knowing God's word. We know that God blessed Solomon with wisdom. We know that, that that's what Solomon was seeking after and asked for. And God blessed him with it. God gave him a wise heart. God gave him understanding more than any of the other kings of the earth. So he was able to answer these questions. Now, as servants of the Lord, if we want to have a fame concerning the name of the Lord, we need to be well-versed in the Bible. We need to know God's word. So when someone comes to us, when the proud person comes to you and wants to prove you with hard questions, you can give them an answer. You can provide, thus saith the Lord to them. And not let them shut you down. Not let them ruin, you know, the, the, the excellence of the Lord and his name. By you not being able to answer that. And especially someone like Solomon who was in a position. He was someone who was touting the word of the Lord. He was someone who built the temple unto the Lord. He was also able to answer all the questions. Now, the Bible says you don't have to turn there to stay in 1 Kings 10. 1 Peter chapter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. So this gives us a perfect example of the way we ought to be. We ought to always be ready to give an answer. Now he says here in the context of this passage of 1 Peter 3, to give an answer of a reason of the hope that is in you. So we need to be able to always give an answer why we're saved, why we have faith in God. That is the primary thing. You ought to be able to answer that question. And if you are saved, if you're a believer and you can't answer that question very well, then shame on you. You need to make sure that you're ready to answer at least that question. That doesn't mean you need to be able to answer every question that Solomon answered. But you need to at least be able to answer... The reason of your hope in Jesus Christ. Everyone needs to have that. And also, we, need, we ought to have this good conscience where it says, you know, hey, people are going to be speaking evil of you, but let that speaking evil be falsely because you're just doing what's good and you're doing what's right and people are coming and attacking you. Don't let it be because you're actually involved in that nonsense. See, up to this point, and we're going to see, in chapter 10, this is the pinnacle of of Israel and Solomon's reign. This is the height. This is the peak. This is Solomon at the height of his glory, at the height of his wisdom. Everything's going great, and it's all going to go downhill from here. We're going to get to that point. Actually, I'm going to point out the part of the chapter that I believe is the tipping point, where this is, now all of a sudden, he's been lifted up in pride, and now all of a sudden, it, it begins his descent until the end of his reign. So let's keep reading here in verse number four. The Bible says, And when the queen of Sheba had seen all Solomon's wisdom and the house that he had built and the meat of his table and the sitting of his servants and the attendance of his ministers and their apparel and his cupbearers and his ascent by which he went up into the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. So here she comes up, this queen, right, with all this substance and she has this great parade and she comes into town. And she sees what a leader Solomon really is. She sees his truthfulness to God's word. She sees his servants. She sees the real wealth and and the, the, the fruits of Solomon's faith in the Lord is ultimately what it boils down to. He had so much wisdom, so much of God's wisdom. He knew how to lead. He knew how how to to deal with people. His servants were happy. He had people working for him. They all had a smile on their face. They were all dressed well. They were all in their place, doing their job, and doing it happily. They didn't have to be forced to do the work. Solomon was a great leader. There was also an abundance of wealth. Not that we live for money or riches or anything, but we see all of the, the, the ultimate fruits of God's blessing upon Solomon because he sought the wisdom and because he had that wise heart and, and because of all the good that he had done. Not only did Solomon have wisdom, but he lived it. 
He made his decisions on it. He walked the walk. He didn't just talk the talk. See, you can have a lot of wisdom and not do anything with it. The Bible says that knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. We need to have both. We need to not just get in your Bible and study and learn. Yes, that's important, but you need to take what you learn and apply it and use it and put it into practice and put it into use every single day. We see an example of Solomon doing that very thing. He had the wisdom and he was putting it into practice. And the queen of Sheba was humbled. And the Bible says, you know, there was no more spirit in her, right? So the attitude that she came in with, when she heard all of his answers, she saw the way everything's going, she's like, this is not the way my kingdom's run, right? I mean, it's one thing to be in power and to, and to have control over people the way that, that she probably did as being a queen. But it's another thing to have the people, not just in subjection, because, you know, maybe because of their fear, but because they love it and, and, they're, and they're enjoying their service and everybody's happy, when you have an entire kingdom of people who basically are, are happy to serve, I mean, we saw that it wasn't a big deal even when he taxed the land, right? Everyone was on board. Everyone was in one accord. Everybody was, was you know, overall as a whole doing the same thing and, and, and willing and wanting to serve the Lord and do, and do that which is right. So um, when she came in and saw all this, it floored her. She no more had that proud attitude when she saw Solomon's wisdom as well as how everything worked great when you follow God's way of doing things. One of the things that came to my mind when, when I was reading this and studying and preparing for this sermon of, of how Solomon is following God's methods and, and, and really listening to the Lord and doing what God told him to do and using that wisdom and, and people kind of seeing the result of that is with rearing children. There's a lot of people who are amazed to see children sitting down, children behaving themselves, even a three-year-old being able to go out to eat and sit down and not just run all over the place and not just make a huge mess and actually know how to behave themselves in public. And the reason why they're amazed is because they're not following God's word. They're not following God's plan. But see, what a lot of people don't want to know is how you get there. Everyone wants to criticize you for following God's methods. You're going to have people attacking you and speaking evil concerning your conversation in Christ, concerning the way that you conduct yourself. People want to speak evil of you using the methods that the Bible gives in regards to rearing children, which is spanking your children, which is not sparing the rod. Which is, thou shalt beat them with the rod and shalt deliver their soul from hell. They don't want to see that. They want to talk bad about that. But then they love it when you come over and your kids are a blessing. They love to see how well your family is just happy and enjoys each other and everything, you know, and, and things are going really well. But they don't like it, the, you know, the, to go through it God's way. Well, I'll tell you what, that's the only way to do it. You want to do it right, you have to follow God's plan, God's prescription, and God's wisdom. Solomon had that wisdom. That's where, that's where you get that teaching from. Most is from Proverbs on how to rear the children right. Solomon knew how to, how to keep his kingdom right, and he knew how to raise children right, because we find that in the book of Proverbs. Now, let's continue on here. Look at verse number 6. 1 Kings chapter number 10. Verse number six. And she said to the king, It was a true report that I heard in mine own land of thy acts and of thy wisdom. Howbeit I believed not the words until I came, and mine eyes had seen it. And behold, the half was not told me. Thy wisdom and prosperity exceeded the fame which I heard. So we see a couple things here. One of them is, is how magnificent the, the kingdom really was. And the wisdom that Solomon possessed because, first of all, she's saying, you know, the reports I was hearing about you, she's like, I didn't believe it. Meaning she was hearing so much about him, she was thinking, no way that could that be true. I have to go and see it for myself. And then on top of that, she's saying, well, I didn't believe it because I didn't think that was possible. But the half wasn't even told me. She's like... It's above and beyond even the reports that I was hearing that I couldn't believe. Seeing the, the wisdom, seeing the way everything's working out, seeing the, the light that Solomon had through the wisdom of God. But 
But also another thing that, that, again, popped into my mind as I was preparing for the sermon was, you know, she didn't believe the word. She didn't have faith that that was possible. She didn't have faith in the wisdom of God and that God can do such great things and that God can, can build such a great city and that God could raise up such a great leader. She had to see it with her eyes. And you remember Thomas. Doubting Thomas, when Jesus came back, Jesus said unto him, John 20, 29, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. It all comes down to faith. Over and over again, the theme of the Bible is having that faith. That's where our salvation comes from. And that's where ultimately being obedient to God's word, we need to have faith. We need to have faith that this is God's word and that what he's telling us is true and right. And we just need to do it because we have faith that it is right, that it is true. And we'll be blessed as a result. We need to have faith in every aspect of our life, starting with our salvation, continuing on throughout every other aspect of our life. We should be convinced by God's word without need of physical evidence as the proud queen of Sheba needed. The Bible also explains to us, and again, here's one little tidbit, one little piece of information here, another application, or a, 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 not an application, but a foreshadowing of the of the millennial reign of Christ just in this statement about how magnificent things were there the bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9 but as it is written i have not seen nor ear heard neither have entered into the heart of man the things which god hath prepared for them that love him when God sets up his kingdom here, when we receive our wards, when we're ruling and reigning in Christ, it's going to be magnificent. It's going to be something that, you know, I heard about it, but maybe I didn't quite believe it or I didn't even know the half of it, right? Whatever you're imagining right now about things are going to be when we get to heaven, when we get to rule and reign with Christ, you don't even know the half of it. And that is something to look forward to. That is something to provide us strength and to provide us hope and, and to, to get excited about because we're getting nearer and nearer to that time. We're going to read through another chunk here in 1 Kings chapter 10. Look down at verse number 8. Happy are thy men. Happy are these thy servants which stand continually before thee and that hear thy wisdom. Blessed be the Lord thy God which delighted in thee to set thee on the throne of Israel. Now she's given the recognition to the Lord. Remember, she heard the fame of Solomon concerning the Lord. Now she's bringing up the Lord and says, hey, blessed be the Lord thy God. What a great testimony. Look at the life that Solomon's leading at this point. He's bringing people to him to try to prove him, to try to prove him wrong. And, he, and they can't prove him wrong. They see the wisdom. They see the light. And they say, you know what? Blessed be the Lord thy God. And they're giving God the credit. And they're giving God the glory. And God's getting the honor as a result of Solomon's walk with God. To this point in his life. Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighted in thee to set thee on the throne of Israel. Because the Lord loved Israel forever, therefore made he thee king to do judgment and justice. And what a, that's a great compliment to Solomon saying, hey, look, because God loves this nation, because God loves Israel forever, he made you king. Because you're a good king. Because you're leading these people in righteousness and in truth. You're not being bought. You're not being, you know, being paid off. You don't have this, this wicked uh, um, judgment coming from you. You're ruling your people in truth and they're happy and they're loving it. Verse number 10. And she gave the king 120 talents of gold and of spices very great store and precious stones. There came no more such abundance of spices as these which the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. And the navy also of Hiram that brought gold from Ophir, brought in from Ophir great plenty of almond trees and precious stones. And the king made of the almond trees pillars for the house of the Lord and for the king's house, harps also and psalteries for singers. There came no such almond trees, nor were seen unto this day. So, real quickly here, between the spices, the precious stones, all of these, these real precious Items are just being brought into Jerusalem. The elm trees, you know, they're basically saying there are no trees like this. I mean, the, the, the trees that they found and cut down and brought into the city, it's just this great wealth. The spices that were brought in, like we've never seen this before. All of this wonderful wealth now is being transferred and being brought into Jerusalem. Like I said, they're at their peak. They're in their golden age. They're in their, their era of just everything's going great for them. They're on top of the world at this point, so to speak, right? 
Verse 13, And King Solomon gave unto the queen of Sheba all her desire, whatsoever she asked, beside that which Solomon gave her of his royal bounty. So she turned and went to her own country, she and her servants. Look at verse 14. Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 603 score and six talents of gold. That seems like an odd statement. Why, why are they just you know, stating this figure? And then just continuing on, beside that, in verse 15, beside that he had of the merchantmen and of the traffic of the spice merchants and of all the kings of Arabia and of the governors of the country. And, and it goes on and on about the wealth. But it, it, it makes a point to say, you know what? The weight of gold that, got, that came to Solomon in one year was 603 score and six talents of gold. This isn't a coincidence. This number is mentioned one other time in the entire Bible. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 18, the Bible says, Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and six, or 666. That number that came in to Solomon, that gold, carries the same number as the mark of the beast. This is the point. This is the point that I believe in this chapter, and this is the point in Solomon's life where I believe that Solomon is being lifted up with pride. That I believe that Solomon now, his heart begins to turn a little bit. This is the beginning of it. Is that Satan has entered Jerusalem. Satan has attacked Solomon's heart through gold. Through the wealth. Through the riches. Through the glory. It's not a mistake that the, the amount of gold is 666 that came in. This is where I believe the beginning of Solomon's corruption started. It's not where it ended. I believe this is the point where it starts. Now let's keep reading the chapter and I think you'll see that the more we continue to go, now it's just going to continue to talk about more of the wealth. But from this point on, the great testimony of Solomon, the great, the great deeds and the great you know, works and everything else that he had done, it's not really talking about that anymore. And we're going to see next week in chapter 11 kind of how it finishes. We're going to get into that a little bit tonight. But let's, uh, let's keep reading here. Verse number 16. And King Solomon made 200 targets of beaten gold. 600 shekels of gold went to one target. And he made 300 shields of beaten gold. Three pound of gold went to one shield. And the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. Okay, this is when you know that you have more money than you know what to do with. When you're literally making targets of gold. Right? I mean, think about a target. Like you make a target for archery or for you know, shooting guns or whatever, and you're just making it out of gold. Like here's a target. You know, they're not using it, I'm sure, but just, here's a target of gold. And we're making shields of gold. You're not going to use a shield of gold in the field. That's not going to be the, 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 the best use of, you know, the best metal to use. Gold's a soft metal, right? You're not going to use that. You're going to use a steel and something that's, that's light and, and resilient, right? It's all just for show. It's all just to, to, to put out there. When you have that much gold, you're like, what should we do with all this gold? I don't know. Let's make a whole bunch of shields and targets. <laughs> you, you know you got a lot of money coming in. And this is, you know, again, this is being stated now after it's mentioned. And a talent is a lot. So 606, 666 of, of you know, talents of gold is a lot. It's a, it's a lot of weight. It's a lot of gold that came in. And that wasn't even all of it, but I mentioned that. So let's keep going here. Verse number 18. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with the best gold. So not only is there a throne of ivory, ivory is a precious material, but then he's overlaying the ivory with gold. The throne had six steps and the top of the throne was round behind and there were stays on either side on the place of the seat and two lions stood beside the stays. And twelve lions stood there on the one side and on the other upon the six steps. There was not the like made in any kingdom. So there were six steps leading up to the throne and there was a lion at each step on each side. So there were six lions on one side, six lions on the other side, getting up to the top, which represents, the, I believe, the twelve tribes of Israel, uh, the twelve lions. And um, it says here in verse number 21, And all King Solomon's drinking vessels were of gold, and all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. None were of silver. It was nothing accounted of in the days of Solomon. Again, just showing the wealth. And this wasn't even in the, in the temple of the Lord now with the vessels of gold. It says this was in the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon. This is just some other place that Solomon built because he wanted to build it. 
just some other thing that was in his heart to build. Not a sin, just, just another place. So, like, it's one thing to have all the precious things in the house of the Lord, right? And, and, and bring the glory and honor of, of, of these valuable items to, 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 to glorify God's temple, right? But now he's got so much abundance, it's, it's you know, prevailing everywhere. But again, I think we're going to see this same type of richness in the millennial kingdom as well. And this is a foreshadowing of that. Let's keep going here. Verse number 22. For the king had at sea a navy of Tharshish with the navy of Hiram. Once in three years came the navy of Tharshish bringing gold and silver, ivory and apes and peacocks. So King Solomon exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and for wisdom. And all the earth sought to Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. Now we're going to turn to Isaiah chapter 2. Turn to Isaiah chapter number 2. Keep your finger here. We're not done First Kings just yet. We're almost done in First Kings. But I want to just stop right here and point this out when it said that all the earth sought to Solomon to hear his wisdom. Right? He's got this great wisdom. Everyone's hearing about him. He's got this great fame. And everyone wants to hear these, just these words out of Solomon because it's great wisdom. You can learn something from him. And think about how much wisdom a person would have to have in order for you to want to just travel from wherever your home country is to hear what this guy has to say, right? That's that's a lot of that's that's impressive, right? Again, though the foreshadowing we could see in Isaiah chapter two. Look at verse number one, Isaiah two verses one. Now this is a, the prophecy of the millennial reign of Christ. The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, and it shall come to pass in the last days. That the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. Look at this. And all nations shall flow unto it. When Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning from the mountain, when Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning in Jerusalem, all nations are going to flow unto it. All nations are going to flow unto Jesus Christ to hear his wisdom, to hear his teaching. And he's going to be the king of kings and lord of lords in that day, ruling and reigning with a rod of iron. Look at verse number three. And many people shall go and say, come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways. And we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. This is a prophecy, prophesying of the millennial reign of Christ. This hasn't happened yet. We have haven't had this world peace. We haven't had people beating their swords in the plowshares because there's just no more war anymore because Jesus is in charge. And all the nations are flowing unto Jesus. Now we do know in the reign of Christ, there are going to be some nations that are still unsaved. But they're going to be under the rule of Jesus Christ. And those that are saved, when Jesus Christ comes back, we're going to meet our Lord together in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. But where he's going to give us at the judgment seat of Christ, he's going to give us our rewards, and we're going to rule and reign with Christ on this earth during that millennial reign. And that's pretty exciting too. And who are we going to be reigning over? He's going to be reigning over all the nations of the earth. See, Jesus is going to be the king. But there's going to be governors, there's going to be other officers, there's going to be people that are ruling and reigning in that kingdom with them. And it's going to be a great time. It's going to be a time of great peace. There's going to be a time of Jesus' law is, is enforced. Jesus' law is, is, is the law of the land across all nations. And it's going to be a great time. But that's, we, we see here the same language being used of, of the way that the people came to hear Solomon's wisdom is a foreshadowing of the way things are going to be during that millennial reign of Christ. Go back to 1 Kings chapter 25. 1 Kings chapter 25. 1 Kings 10, excuse me, 1 Kings 10. I don't know if I said chapter 25, we're in verse 25. 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 25. And they brought every man his present, vessels of silver and vessels of gold and garments and armor and spices, horses and mules, a rate year by year. Verse 26. And Solomon gathered together chariots and horsemen. And he had a thousand and four hundred chariots, 
and 12,000 horsemen whom he bestowed in the cities for chariots and with the king at Jerusalem. And the king made silver to be in Jerusalem as stones and cedars made he to be as the sycamore trees that are in the vale for abundance. Now, oh, I should have had you kept your finger in Isaiah chapter 2. Flip back if you would to Isaiah chapter 2. I, I'm sorry, I forgot because we, we're going to look at the rest of that chapter. But it ties in here with, with the rest of what we're seeing here. So, in verse 24, 1 Kings 10, we saw all the earth seeking unto Solomon to hear his wisdom. We compared that with Isaiah chapter 2, the first five verses that's going to show us of the millennial reign of Christ. Of, of, you know, the, all the people of the world basically coming to be taught of Jesus, to, to hear his ways, and, um, and all the nations flowing unto him. But then we see here in 1 Kings 25 through 27, we see the vessels of silver, you know, these presents being brought in, Solomon then gathering chariots and horsemen unto himself. And the king made silver to be in Jerusalem as stones, and cedars made it to be as the sycamore trees. And then um, in, in Isaiah 2, verse 6, see, I believe those things are going to be are symbolic of the pride that is swelling in Solomon's heart and in Israel's heart. Because after that great prophecy in Isaiah 2, verses 1 through 5, verse number 6 says, Therefore thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob, because they be replenished from the east. And our soothsayers like the Philistines, and they please themselves and the children of strangers. Look at verse number 7. Remember what we just read. Their land also is full of silver and gold. Neither is there any end of their treasures. Their land is also full of horses. Didn't we just read that? That, that Solomon, it says Solomon gathered together chariots and horsemen. And he had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen whom he bestowed in the cities and the chariots. And it said that he had um, the king made silver to be in Jerusalem as stones. So we see the same exact items being used for that wealth in Isaiah chapter 2. Verse 7 says, Their land is also full of horses. There is neither any end of their chariots. Verse number 8 says, Their land is also as full of idols. We'll get to that in a minute. They worship the work of their own hands. That which their own fingers have made, and the mean man boweth down, and the great man humbleth himself. Therefore, forgive them not. Right? So in the first part of Isaiah chapter 2, we saw the, the, the great, you know, the, the exciting prophecy looking forward to that. And then near the end there, it's talking about, look, now don't forgive them because they've got all these riches, they've got all this wealth, and you know what? They made idols, and they strayed from the Lord. Therefore, forgive them not. This is what happens in the life of Solomon, exactly. We see... Um, we'll just skip ahead real quick to 1 Kings chapter 11. I'm going to cover this next week a little bit more in depth, but there, there's so much stuff to preach on, it's not a big deal to just kind of cover this now. We know what happens, because first, I believe Solomon's heart is, is uh, infected by, by the pride and by this wealth and by the, the, the amount of gold that came in. But then... We also see, look at verse number 1 of chapter 11. It says, but the, we're done in Isaiah chapter 2, by the way. You can go back to 1 Kings. We'll get to chapter 11. But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you. For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love, and he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. And then he ends up, it says in verse number 4, For it came to pass when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. And, and it talks about how he went and he built all these altars under these false gods. So he brought idols into the land. Isaiah chapter 2, where we saw that, we saw that the land was full of silver. It was full of these horses and chariots. And we're going to get to that in a minute also. And then it was full of idols. Therefore, forgive them not. This is what Sol the path that Solomon went down that I believe started with that gold. First Kings, let's look at verse 28. We're going to close out the chapter here, and then we're going to go into um, some more scriptures. First Kings 10, verse 28. And Solomon had horses brought out of Egypt and linen yarn 
The king's merchants received the linen yarn at a price, and a chariot came up and went out of Egypt for 600 shekels of silver and a horse for 150. And so for all the kings of the Hittites and for the kings of Syria did they bring them out by their means. So this last point I'm going to focus on before we get into more prophecy scriptures. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 17. We're going to look at here where it says Solomon had, had horses brought out of Egypt. That is also something he was not supposed to do. Not supposed to do according to God's word. Deuteronomy chapter 17. Fifth book of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, the biggest numbers, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 17. We're going to see, we're going to see what God's word says regarding kings. Remember, at this point, when Moses got the law, there was no kings. And after that, there was judges. And that was the way that God had, had, had established that the, the government ought to be run through judges. But he knew that they were going to one day have a king, because God knows everything. And God actually put in a provision in his law for the day when they do have a king. And he gave rules and said, this is the way that the king needs to be. If you're going to have a king, he needs to follow these rules. Deuteronomy 17, we're going to start reading in verse number 14. The Bible says, When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me, thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. <clears throat> thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. So this is one where it's not a foreigner, right? And you could see here, you know, also um, the way that this nation was founded, some principles on how the president needs to not be a foreigner and things like that. But um, I digress. I don't want to get into that at all. Um, so here we're going to see, look at verse number 16, God's rules for a king. But he shall not multiply horses to himself. What did Solomon do? He had horses and chariots in abundance, right? nor cause the people to return to Egypt to the end that he should multiply horses. What did Solomon do? He brought horses out of Egypt. What did God say? He should not multiply horses and should not um, have caused the people to return to Egypt to the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord hath said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. When God brought his people out of the world, when God saved his people out of that furnace of iron, out of the, the house of bondage, out of Egypt, he says, I don't want you going back there. I've delivered you from that. Don't go back. Don't get their horses. Don't, don't trust in their might. Don't get caught up in this illusion of strength that Egypt can provide you through their horses. Don't have anything to do with it. And the kings, don't rely on that might. You need to rely on God. And what did Solomon do? He had all this wealth. The wealth infected his heart. He forgot about the, the, the word of the Lord and went back to Egypt and got horses out of Egypt. Verse number 17 here in Deuteronomy 17. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself that his heart turn not away. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. Solomon did all of those things. We saw that he had 700 wives and 300 concubines there in chapter 11. We also saw, saw how much silver and gold he multiplied unto himself in the land. All of these things God said not to do. All of these things Solomon knew. He knew this. He knew God's word. Verse number 18. And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him. And he shall read therein all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. That his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. That was God's promise. Solomon disobeyed that, and we end up seeing the result of um, Solomon's disobedience. Now, turn if you would to Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah chapter 60. That pretty much covers 
1 Kings chapter 10, as far as all the points that I wanted to make specifically that we can learn, you know, various points out of that chapter. Now, we already read this chapter. I went through verse by verse. We had the entire chapter read before we got started. Hopefully you can keep some of these passages in your mind and how that picture of the millennial reign of Christ that we already had seen to this point and, and remember some of the various things that we've already read as we read through this scripture now in Isaiah chapter 60. We're read, start reading in verse number 1. The Bible reads, and we're going to read the entire chapter because this entire chapter is, is pertinent to this, to this prophecy. And you're going to see how awesome this is. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. I believe that this is talking about the end times, when the end times get real dark, when there's darkness over the face of the earth, right before Jesus comes back. When there's exceeding wickedness, when it's like it was in the days of Lot, and like it was in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. This is what I believe this is talking about. He says, but I'm going to come for you and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Verse number three, and the Gentiles shall come to thy light and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Lift up thine eyes round about and see all they gather themselves together. They come to thee. Thy sons shall come from far and thy daughter shall be nursed at thy side. Then thou shalt see and flow together, and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee. The forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. Look at verse number 6. The multitude of camels shall cover thee. The dromedaries of Midian and Ephah, all they from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense, and they shall show forth the praises of the Lord. This is talking about a future event. And as we get further, you'll see this is talking about the millennial reign. And it also is talking about the new heaven and new earth. I think it's talking about the the whole thing. And and a lot of times when you see prophetic passages in the Old Testament, you've got you've got them kind of mixed together a little bit. And it's not quite as clear where 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 it starts and where it ends. But that's why we have the New Testament to help shine the light on this. But what we're going to see here is that this is all prophesying end times event. So we're seeing very similar passages in wording that we already saw. All they from Sheba shall come. Remember the queen of Sheba came. They shall bring gold and incense and they shall show forth the praises of the Lord. Verse number 7. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together unto thee. The rams of Nebaioth shall minister unto thee. They shall come up with acceptance on mine altar. And I will glorify the house of my glory. What was the temple? It was the house of the Lord. Right? And all the people were coming unto it. And they hear Solomon. And coming to the house of the Lord. Verse number 8. Who are these that fly as a cloud and as the doves through their windows? Surely the isle shall wait for me. Look at this. The ships of Tarshish first. To bring thy sons from far. Their silver and their gold with them. Unto the name of the Lord thy God. And to the Holy One of Israel. Because he hath glorified thee. Solomon had ships being sent to Tarshish. That brought back the silver and the gold. And the peacocks and the apes. And all the other uh, uh, magnificent things. Same thing that we're seeing here. Verse number 10. And the sons of strangers shall build up thy walls. That's how the, 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 those were the people who were bondmen, the strangers, right? The foreigners, the people that were supposed to have been defeated in the land were the ones that built up the temple, that built up the, you know, the walls and everything else that Solomon had built. They were the ones being levied. They were the ones being used for this. The sons of the strangers shall build up thy walls and their kings shall minister unto thee. For in my wrath, I smote thee, but in my favor, have I had mercy on thee. Therefore, thy gates shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day nor night. That men may bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles, and that their kings may be brought. Look at verse 12. For the nation and kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish. Yea, those nations shall be utterly wasted. When Jesus Christ comes back, all the nations of the earth are going to be subject unto him. He is going to be ruling and reigning with a rod of iron. We're going to see that here in a few minutes. Verse number 13, the glory of Lebanon shall come unto thee, the fir tree, the pine tree, and the box together, to beautify the place of my sanctuary, and I will make the place of my feet glorious. The sons also of them that afflicted thee 
shall come bending unto thee. And all they that despise thee shall bow down themselves down at the soles of thy feet. And they shall call thee the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. And this is, you know, the Bible says that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father. This is, this is again, talking about that time in the future when Jesus Christ sets up his reign. I, mean, so I just want to point these things out to you so we know where we're at and we could, we could see directly from, from the context of the scripture what we're talking about. Let's, keep, let's read, finish up the rest of this chapter here, verse 15. Whereas thou hast been forsaken and hated, so that no man went through thee, I will make thee an eternal excellency, a joy of many generations. Thou shalt also suck the milk of the Gentiles, and shalt suck the breasts of kings. And thou shalt know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. For brass I will bring gold, and for iron I will bring silver, and for wood, brass, and for stones, iron. Look at it, for stones, iron. Remember, um, you know, he had silver, whereas stones are not exactly the same. But he's talking about all of these more precious things are replacing the, the less valuable things. I will also make thy officers peace and thine exactors righteousness. Verse 18, violence shall no more be heard in thy land. And remember also, that reign of Solomon was a time of peace. None of the, there was no war during the time of Solomon. David was the man, his hands were bloody, he couldn't build the temple of the Lord. That's why Solomon had to do it. God granted a, a, a full 40 year reign of Solomon of peace. He had people starting to come up in trouble near the end of his reign because of his sins. But basically, Israel was in peace for, a long, for that long period of time when it was, when it was uh, symbolizing this reign of Jesus Christ, the millennial reign of Christ. Violence shall no more, verse 18, violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders, but thou shalt be, but thou shalt call thy walls salvation and thy gates praise. This is now where it jumps into um, the new heaven and the new earth. Verse 19, the sun shall be no more thy light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee, but the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light, and thy God thy glory. Thy sun shall no more go down, neither shall thy moon withdraw itself, for the Lord shall be thine everlasting light, and the days of thy mourning shall be ended. Thy people also shall be all righteous, they shall inherit the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. A little one shall become a thousand, and a small one a strong nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it in his time. Now turn, if you would, to Psalm 72. Psalm 72, we're almost done, but we need to see this also. The, the similarities are astounding. These are clearly talking about the same events. We clearly see this foreshadowing. Psalm 72. Some Bibles, you might, you might see this. It says it's a psalm for Solomon. Mind you, this is David writing this psalm. This is before any of these things that we just read in 1 Kings chapter 10 have even happened. None of this stuff happened. David's right because by this point, David's given up the ghost, right? The, the events happening in 1 Kings chapter 10, David's not even around anymore. David made this psalm for Solomon before all this stuff happened. Keep that in mind. Verse 1. Give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. He shall judge thy people with righteousness and thy poor with judgment. The mountains shall bring peace to the people... And the little hills by righteousness. He shall judge the poor of the people. He shall save the children of the needy. And shall break in pieces the oppressor. They shall fear thee as long as the sun and moon endure. Throughout all generations. He shall come down like rain upon the mown grass. As showers that water the earth. In his days shall the righteous flourish. An abundance of peace so long as the moon endureth. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river unto the ends of the earth. Notice this. This isn't talking about Solomon anymore. Solomon was not ruling and reigning the world. Right? Solomon was ruling and reigning over Israel. He did not have a world government established. He was the king over Israel. The queen of Sheba came up to visit him. Other nations came to visit him. He was not in charge of a global uh, government. Jesus will be. 
So we could see here already that, yes, this is a psalm for Solomon, but obviously it's prophetic, obviously it's God's word. And this is talking about, again, we're going to see references here to the millennial reign of Christ. Verse 9, they that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him and his enemies shall lick the dust. Look at this, another mention, the kings of Tarshish and of the isles shall bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. This happened in Solomon's day, and it's going to happen in the days of Jesus Christ as well. Verse number 11. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. That wasn't Solomon. This is talking again about what's going to happen during the reign of Jesus Christ. Verse 12. For he shall deliver the needy when he crieth, and the the poor also, and him that hath no helper. He shall spare the poor and needy, and shall save the souls of the needy. He shall redeem their soul from deceit and violence, and precious shall their blood be in his sight. And he shall live, and to him shall be given of the gold of Sheba. Prayer also shall be made for him continually, and daily shall he be praised. There shall be an handful of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains. The fruit thereof shall be or shall shall shake like Lebanon, and they of the city shall flourish like grass of the earth. His name shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as long as the sun and men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. This is talking about Christ, of course. Verse number 18, Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only doeth wondrous things. And blessed be his glorious name forever. And let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. Just in case you had to know proof, how do you know David said this? Because the last verse says, The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. I don't know about you, but to me it's amazing to see all the correlations, all the links, all the things. The the silver and the gold from, specifically, from Sheba. We see the Queen of Sheba coming. We see these things happening. We see everything linking these together. We see the peace. We see the ruling reign. We see the people coming to hear His wisdom. We see the people happy. We see everybody that's serving happy and enjoying their service, just as we will in our service to Jesus Christ during this reign as his servants, as his officers, as those that are under our Lord and our King. That's how we're going to be. <clears throat> Turn if you want to Revelation 19, last place we're going to look at. We're almost done. It's the last place. <clears throat> this millennial reign of Christ is going to begin. It's going to start with Jesus setting up his kingdom and he's going to rule with a rod of iron over the nations of the earth the events that have have yet to happen we're going to have the antichrist and and the the abomination of desolation stand where it ought not to sit in the temple we're going to have the antichrist proclaim himself to be God he's going to have signs and lying wonders he's going to do an uh, unleash an attack against the saints against the believers it's going to be a time of great tribulation for us where we, we're going to be persecuted like believers are going to be persecuted like they never have been throughout history. Before he gets to every single saint, Jesus Christ is going to come in the clouds. He's going to catch us up. Those that endure to the end shall be saved. Our flesh will be saved. We're going to be transfigured. We're going to get our new bodies. We're going to meet the Lord Jesus Christ in the air. The dead in Christ shall rise first. And then thus which are, which are alive and remain shall join them together in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. From that moment, God's going to pour out his wrath on this earth for in the space of about three years, three and a half years. Just just punishing and, and, and pouring out his wrath upon, upon the kings and the wickedness and the evildoers of this world. And all those great, horrible plagues that we read about in Revelation, that's all going to happen. And then at the end of that, we're going to see here in Revelation chapter 19, we're going to pick up. Jesus Christ is going to come with his army. He's going to be riding on his horse, and he's going to set up his kingdom. He's going to defeat the enemies, set up his kingdom, and establish that thousand-year reign. And there's going to be peace on earth worldwide for a thousand years under the reign of Jesus Christ. This is the event that we're talking about. After those things, after that thousand years... 
Because during that thousand years, one of the reasons why there's not going to be any problems is because Satan's going to be bound up and he's going to be cast into that lake of fire. Or he's going to, no, actually, Satan's going to go into hell. The beast and the false prophet are, are thrown into the lake of fire. Satan's going to be, going to be cast into hell for that thousand years. The end of that thousand years, Satan's going to be loosed from hell. He's going to come back up. And this is how we know that there's still unbelievers on the earth during this time, even though Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning, because he's going to go out, he's going to deceive the nations, all those people, everyone who's not saved, you know, and he's going to gather them together for one last battle. And at that time, they're just all going to be destroyed. You're not even going to have to fight. God's just going to open up his mouth and they're all done. They're dead. And then there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. You know, the, 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 the first heaven and the first earth are going to melt away. They're going to vanish. It's going to be gone. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And that's when there's not going to be any need for the sun or the moon because Jesus Christ is going to provide the light thereof. The, day, the gates are going to be open, as we saw in um, Isaiah chapter 2, that, um, or is Isaiah 6, I don't remember. But um, that's when that happens. So we look at Revelation 19. This is the beginning of, of that millennial reign of Christ. Just to give you a little bit of backdrop, just a, just kind of a, a real brief overview of the events that are going to be happening in the future and what we're specifically looking at. Revelation 19, verse 13, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Yes, this is Jesus Christ when He comes to set up His kingdom is going to come with fierceness and wrath of the Almighty God to set up His kingdom. And He's going to rule with a rod of iron. You know, my last point is a lot of people have this, this view of Jesus that is, it, it's, just, it's incorrect, it's inaccurate. Mm -hmm. Is Jesus loving and merciful? Absolutely He is. Absolutely. But what happens is when people focus so much on that and never hear about any of the other aspects of Jesus Christ and how He is holy and how He is going to come and He's going to come with the fierceness and wrath and He's going to destroy the wicked nations. He's going to set up His kingdom. That's an aspect of Jesus you need to remember exists. He came the first time to seek and save that which is lost. He didn't come to set up the kingdom. He didn't come to rule and reign. He came to be a servant. He came to minister. But you know what? That's not how he's coming back the second time. He came the first time so that the world might be saved. Don't mistake his first coming for his second coming. Because the second coming isn't going to be the same as the first coming. When he comes and, and when he sets up his kingdom, that's not going to be the same as when he came to, to, to seek and save that which is lost. He's going to come, he's going to rule with a rod of iron. You know, people think that we're so, you know, we look at God's laws and you say, oh, you're so, you know, they're, why are you so, you know, why are you so legalistic? Because we love the law of the Lord. What do you think Jesus is going to do when he comes back? You think he's just going to let everything go? There's going to be unsaved people. You think he's just going to let them get away with just, Anything that the Bible says is abominable and, and is worthy of death? You think he's going to be okay with that? I'll tell you what, he's not because he's going to rule with a rod of iron. Because his law is going to be the law of the land. It's going to be established and everybody's going to be following that law. And he's in charge and he's going to make sure that it comes to pass. And we're going to see the fruits and the, and the blessedness that comes with being in obedience to God's laws. We're going to see how good things could have been. When Jesus is reigning. If we would have just made Jesus our king to begin with. And obeyed these laws. Without him having to physically be here. If we could do that. We'd be able to see the same blessings. And the same fruitfulness of that. But he's going to come down and we will see. We will see the way it's going to be. And he's going to come and rule with a rod of iron. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much. For this chapter, God, I thank you for revealing so much unto us, dear Lord. I pray that you will please continue to, to guide us and show us wisdom. God, your, your word is magnificent. Lord, I love studying your words. I pray that you please open up our hearts, open up our understanding, Lord. Teach us some more truths. Help us to see the great web and interconnection of all these scriptures, dear Lord, and, and, and see deeper into the perfection of your word. God, there is no way, there is no way that men from various time periods, 
hundreds of years apart that didn't know each other can write these words and have them fit and interlock so perfectly. From the writings of John and Isaiah and, 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 and Solomon and the, you know, and the kings and, and all the various prophecies, dear Lord, how they fit together so amazingly perfect. It's a wonder. It's a marvel, dear Lord. It truly does show that it is that, that nothing else but, but you could have been involved in the preservation of these words. Lord, we thank you for these words. I pray that you please help this church to grow. Help us to be a good example as Solomon was for so many years, dear Lord, that, that he had wisdom and knowledge and that he also reflected that. And he was known for that by, by um, he was known, the fame was concerning the name of the Lord. God, help us to attain that type of a fame that really brings the attention unto you and to your name, dear Lord. Help us to, to be able to reach the world so that the world can know the name of the Lord, dear God. You help use us to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.